Hello, good morning. Welcome to this second week of the conversation on the proportionality test and the sixth day of discussions and sessions of this conversation. Today, we have with us two persons we've already read, but we are very pleased to be able to listen to them. So we really have great speakers today to kick off the week. First, we are going to listen to Professor David Duarte, who is Associate Professor of the Law School of the University of Lisbon, who will talk about the proportionality in a narrow sense and the formula of the positivist weight. Next, we will listen to Professor Alkmini Fotediu, who is Associate Researcher in the Center of Constitutional Law in Europe, and she will talk about proportionality as a constitutional resilience tool, an outlook from Greece. I remind you that you can send us your questions through our platforms in the respective icons and also through the Supreme Court's platform. Without further ado, I give the floor to Professor David Duarte. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, Diana. Thank you for inviting me. It is a honor to be here, of course. I will uh, now start to screen share my PowerPoint presentation. Let's see if it works. I think it does. Okay. So I will make a presentation on proportionality in a narrow sense and connecting this with the positivist weight formula. This is a presentation that is intimately connected with a paper that uh, I published just one month ago, ago in a book uh, edited by Springer and Jan Ziegman, uh, a book related to some comments on the work of Robert Alexi. So this actually amounts to something that is already published, but is totally fresh since the book uh, is out only for one month. Okay, let's go into the substantive things. Uh, I think that proportionality is a contingent multiple deontic content of a legal system, which means that it either the system has or has not this multiple deontic content. So I'm just here uh, sustaining the contingency of proportionality, which is also totally different from the original uh, idea that it is uh, sustained by the Kiel School. Uh, if it does, it comes either from a normal sentence, mainly in the constitution, or from a customary source, um, which is actually the case, I believe, of Brazil and of uh, Germany, actually. Uh, they don't have any proportionality principle in their constitutionals. I also think that proportionality can be seen as a middle term, which is, it is a word that somehow is put into a constitution whose meaning remits for a specific subset of norms. A subset of norms that is composed by an obligation of suitability, an obligation of necessity, and the proportionality in the narrow sense. All these three norms that we assign to proportionality, they are dependent on a means and condition. So there is always a mean and condition and the means ought to be suitable, suitability, ought to be the least onerous, necessity, and ought to be balanced, which is proportionality in the narrow sense. So proportionality as a norm itself or a subset of norms, each one of them, is triggered when never such condition is met. And I think this condition is met whenever two norms enter into conflict. And this conflict is not solvable by a norm of conflicts because if it is, the problem is um, solved and there is no uh, triggering of proportionality in this uh, situation, this normative situation. An unsolvable, conflict of norms meets the mean ends condition because there are two incompatible norms. Let's think about the permission of X and the prohibition of X. And one must be chosen because as we all know, usually our legal systems 
have the so-called prohibition of non-liquids. So the judge, after all, has to decide. However, when the judge in this kind of conflicts, when he decides uh, choosing a norm instead of another, for instance, choosing the permission of X instead of the prohibition of X, what the judge will do uh, is to sacrifice the prohibition of X as a means to apply the permission of X to the case. So proportionality, proportionality in the narrow sense, it is a norm that imposes means to be balanced regarding some given end and within a scenario of an unsolvable conflict of norms, unsolvable by norms of, of conflicts, of course. The question is, what does it mean to be balanced? Nowadays, we tend to understand that proportionality in the narrow sense means two things. Means uh, the so-called substantive law of balancing. The more the losses in a principle, the more the gains in the opposite principle. And also means the so-called epistemic law of balancing. The more the losses in the principle, the more the certainty. And uh, by certainty, we are obviously making reference to the certainty regarding the underlying premises of the conflict. Let's work with a case. Actually, a case that is not very far away from our present realities. Let's imagine that a norm, norm uh, authority, for instance, a parliament or a government with legislative powers will elect a norm Let's think about a rule. I'm just using principles in the constitution and rules as norms enacted by normative authorities just for the sake of simplicity, because I also do believe that rules, uh, that constitutions have rules, have rules as well, and that they are defeasible in the exact same way as principles are. But just for the sake of simplicity, let's think about uh, rules enacted by a normative authority namely a legislator. And in order to prevent an infectious disease, there are two possible rules. Rule one imposes vaccination with some active substance, 19% effective. Rule two imposes vaccination with another active substance, 20% effective. Both these rules will instantiate two constitutional principles. Principle one, physical integrity. Obviously, physical integrity is against vaccination because we will, be, we will have to be with a needle inside, inside your body and some liquid will be inserted. But on the opposite position, mandatory vaccination will be favorable to public health. So, so we have two contradictory the ontic statuses for governing the rules at hand. Physical integrity against forbids vaccination, public health allows vaccination. It is obvious comparing these underlying premises, 90% effective, 20% effective, that rule one surpassed the necessity test and faces now proportionality in the narrow sense. Let's look into Alex's weight formula. Based on the two laws of balancing, Alex conceived an equation. And this equation um, is conceived in order to represent those laws. And more than that, to give uh, their outcome whenever they are to be applied. Using the famous distinction from Jerzy Wroblewski, the weight formula amounts to the internal justification of balancing in contraposition with the so-called external justification. This is the equation. It is very well known. This is the last uh, conception of the equation, is already the third one. And we know that it has a rule. When the outcome is superior than one prevails the principle in the numerator, when the outcome is below uh, one 
prevails the principle in the denominator. If the outcome is equal to one, there is a stalemate. A stalemate. We already know how these uh, variables of the equation are filled with. We use negative powers for the variables i and w and negative powers to those variables that are related with um, epistemic um, issues of the balancing. And I'm using here the single theoretic scale, which is the one that Alexi uses. So uh, it's very um, familiar. In the vaccination case, with P1 in the uh, denominator, which means below, and P2 in the numerator, which means above, and P1 is physical integrity, and PW is public health, we can just conceive some kind of uh, notation regarding the intensity of interference. We are giving one for to physical public health and just one to physical integrity, meaning that uh, what we are going to gain in public health is much more than what we are going to lose in um, uh, physical integrity. If we just make draws in other all variables, we have a result. This is superior to one, which is four. Then rule one is proportional since P2 overweights P1. Okay, let's now look into the problems of Alex's weight formula. Let's remember the two laws of balancing. The substantive law D um, says the more the loss is in the principle, the more the gains in the opposite principle. The more the loss is in the principle, the epistemic law now, the more the certainty about its premises. Well, as it is visible, these laws contain what is called by mathematicians as a constant of direct proportionality. And the constant of direct proportionality is somehow something that is obtained by this small equation here, where k is the constant and y and x are the maximum satisfaction of p1 and p2. Let me give you a very simple example of our more or less day after day life. Let's imagine a rule such as the more people you have inside your car, the slower you have to drive. This is exactly the same scheme. The more the loss is, the more the gains. Let's imagine that my car just has the maximum speed of 40. And let's imagine that my car has four places. This gives a constant of 10 which means that when I'm alone, driving myself alone, I can reach the maximum speed of 40. But if there are two people inside the car, myself and another one, I will have to decrease the limit to 30. And if there are three people, I have to decrease to 20. So this is useful to see that if I'm driving with someone else side by side, under this rule, the maximum I can drive is 30, but I'm free to drive 20, 15, 10, and so on, and so on, and so on. This very, very simple example shows something that is important. Being a constant of direct proportionality means that proportionality in the narrow sense, each one of the two laws of balancing they do not establish a preference, they just define a limit. And if we use the equation with the triadic scale that we are using for Alex's weight formula, this means that superior or equal to one, the limit is respected, inferior to one, the limit is not respected. Respected, sorry. So Actually, the main point is that none of the two laws of balancing establish a criterion of choice. Let's move on. Let's now take some consequences of this regarding the weight formula. First problem, the, this equation, Alex's equation, does not express the separation. Both laws of balancing are different laws and they have 
each one of them an eliminatory character. <clears throat> we can be below the substantive law, which is here intensities of your interference. We can see that we are losing more in the denominator than we are gaining in the numerator. But because the equation has trade-offs between variables, we can have the opposite preference. So first problem, and this is really uh, significant in my opinion, this rule one already violated the limit of substantive law, but because we have values that are going to decrease this situation, what happens is that the principle in the numerator prevails. So the consequence is that this rule one with this notation is unconstitutional. There are more losses than gains, but because of the trade-offs, the unconstitutionality becomes hidden. So Alex's formula hides unconstitutionalities in my opinion, of course. Second problem, the outcome of the equation is a preference between two principles. The rule of Alex's equation is higher than one P2 prevails, lower P1 prevails. The problem is, is that the laws only point out to a constant of direct proportionality. We can see here exactly the same, the same mistake. Now we have uh, rule one, we are, going give, uh, we are going to give some notations to rule one where they surpass easily the substantive law, but due to the trade-offs, rule one isn't constitutional, but it is not effectively. Third problem, and this is a serious problem. The laws of balancing, and we just read them twice, they do not give support whatsoever for the variable W. Each one only foresees two variables, losses in a principle and gains in the opposite principle. And regarding the epistemic law, we have losses in the principle and certainty about premises in the, in the other one. Variable W is a moral parasite. I do not mean by this that we do not make any kind of moral assessments when we are carrying out a balancing. What do I mean by this is that these moral assessments that we use while carrying out a balancing, they belong to the external justification and not the internal justification of balancing. So by inserting something that belongs to the external justification into the internal justification, the consequence of Alex's weight formula is that he's going to change the outcome of proportionality. Let's look to the variable W, all the others have a draw, but because we decided that principle one, physical integrity is more morally important than public health, we will say that rule one, the rule that oblige uh, to vaccinate is unconstitutional. And this is obviously something that is distorting the application of proportionality in the narrow sense. Fourth problem, a little bit more complicated, but I will try to be as clear as possible. These two variables are um, variables related to epistemic uh, perspectives. And there is a mismatch between the variable are, uh, reliable, reliability of normative uh, underlying premises and the epistemic law of balancing. Rule, uh, this reliability can have a well, value lower than one when the, um, empirical um, certainty is one. When the empirical certainty is one, our doubts about normative reliability are just caused by the amount of interference in itself. However, since they have a decreasing effect, we saw that uh, these two, ver two last variables work in a decreasing way. This, is, this, this kind of situation will always imply that our doubt about this will have a decreasing effect. And this decreasing effect uh, has no sustain whatsoever in both the laws of balancing. 
Well, having been this said, I think that these problems show that Alex's weight formula does not express the elementary character of each law, which implies the possibility of item unconstitutionalities. It contains variables not foreseen in the laws of balancing. The case of variable W is the most visible one. I called it a moral parasite and points out a preference between principles. And this is not, this is, has nothing to do with proportionality in the narrow sense because it is a limit because it comes from two rules that are actually two constants of um, direct proportionality. And this implies that I think that an equation built to express the two laws of balancing is required and having two requirements that sticks to the content of the law, of the laws of both laws of balancing and that respects the separation thesis, meaning no incorporation of morals in the structure of norms enacted by normative authorities as it is the case of proportionality in the narrow sense, at least I'm assuming that. So let's look to the so-called positivist weight formula. Let's remember the substantive law. The more the loss is in a principle, the more the gains in the opposite principle. So the substantive law imposes a, a fraction between G and L. G stands for gains in the defeater principle and L for losses in the defeated principle. The rule of the equation is the rule under assessment is proportional if the quotient is equal or higher than one. We can think about an example. Let's recover the famous rule one, the vaccination with substantive act, uh, um, active substance uh, X implies two of losses in this scale we are using. I'm keeping on using Alex's own scale, but it has four of gains. So this implies, because we are just putting four of gains and two of losses, this equals to two, which means that rule one is compatible with the substantive law. Let's look now to the epistemic law and remember its wording. The more the losses, the more the certainty. This epistemic law is actually very significant because uh, both laws are in a certain way the core of uh, proportionality. I think it is more or less intuitively obvious for any one of us that if you are going to make a choice, you can make whatever choice you want, but it makes no sense to lose more than what you gain with such choice. And this is the core of, substantive, of the substantive law. In the same way, when you are going to make a choice, it also is nonsensical to imply some losses in something that is valued without having any kind of certainty about what are you deciding about. So the epistemic law expresses this other side of proportionality in the narrow sense, which is we somehow need to have some certainty about something when we are just harming some good. And in our present context, uh, what we are harming uh, are exactly constitutional principles. So C stands for the amount of certainty in this equation and L for the losses in the defeated principle. And the rule of the equation is again, the constant of the right proportionality. The rule that we are going to access under this equation is proportional if the quotient is equal or higher than one. We can also see another example. We can just think about four of uh, certainty with two of losses and then we can see that the rule at hand surpassed the epistemic law. Well, the eliminatory character of the substantive law implies that the second part of the equation is only applicable if the quotient of the first one satisfies the constant of the red proportionality defined by its rule, which is one. So 
the so-called positivist wave formula entails two equations connected by a defeasible conditional. And the quotient of the substantive weight, the first part of the equation, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for obtaining the overall assessment of proportionality. And by overall assessment of proportionality, I'm only speaking about proportionality in the narrow sense. So this equation has to be applied in two steps. First step gains in the defeater principle in our example, P2 public health are divided by losses in P1, in our example, physical integrity. And second, on the condition of the quotient of the first division is equal or higher than one, certainty about the underlying premises of the principles are divided by the losses in P1, which is the defeated principle, which is in our example, uh, physical integrity. So we can look into the mathematical definition of the complete positivist weight formula. Here it is the positivist weight formula. Here is the defeasible conditional, which means that the second part of the equation is only applicable or only applied, better said, if the first one meets the rule. And the rule of equation is when we apply, the rule of equation is a statement that defines how to interpret the result of the equation. And the rule of equation is that any rule that we are assessing under this equation is proportional if the outcome, the quotient of substantive weight is equal or higher than one. And if it is not lower than one, if the quotient of epistemic weight is equal or higher than one. And my claim, and with this I will finish, is that this equation expresses much more accurately the tools of balancing and how it was, works better to, in order to apply proportionality in the narrow sense. Thanks a lot for your attention. This is what I thought to tell you in this occasion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Duarte. And now I'm going to present you, Professor Fotiedu. You have the floor, Professor. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about proportionality, a topic uh, that is becoming more and more uh, hot these days. We live in the age of proportionality for quite some time, but this age seems to be also the age of crisis that exerts stress on constitutional rights and rule of law guarantees in liberal democracies. Proportionality proves to be there for rights in good times and in bad times, and as such, it is a constitutional resilience tool, I believe. To approach proportionality as a constitutional resilience tool, I shall put forth a definition of constitutional resilience and examine how proportionality functions in normal conditions, but also during crisis. Then I will focus on the example of Greece as a case study. A disclaimer first, when we engage in comparative law, it is always useful to contemplate on our starting point. I live in Greece, which means that I have experienced the financial crisis before entering the corona crisis. The financial crisis tested primarily social rights, while throughout the current crisis, we are witnessing the simultaneous limitation of various negative rights in what seems to be an unprecedented global experiment on how constitutions respond to extreme conditions. Most interestingly, in many legal orders, we now see the protection of a social right, the right to health, in several locations through the form of the common good as the aim that allows imposing strict limitations on negative rights. This is unprecedented. Constitutional self-awareness is also necessary to avoid miscomprehending the universality of proportionality. It may have become an Esperanto constitutional language. Nonetheless, its application remains constitutional culture dependent. 
not all judiciaries are the same and the meaning given to the steps of proportionality may be overwhelmingly distinct. Universalism and particularism tend to be reconciled in crisis, although the application of proportionality depends on domestic cultural elements. Nonetheless, we can witness a crisis-induced comparability which emerges now, and it has a common denominator, the notion of justification through proportionality. I'll pass now to resilience. A resilient constitution, when faced by a severe crisis, can adopt without losing its normativity and, and there is an end, allows democracy and the rule of law to also demonstrate resilience. At the heart of resilience lies the adapting capacity, the ability to adapt to changing circumstances while fulfilling one's core purpose. Resilience is therefore not expressive of the relationship of a constitution with time, but of the ability of a constitution not only to withstand a severe shock, but to also enable the legal order whose ground rules it sets out to seek recovery within the constraints of these ground rules. An important aspect in the definition of constitutional resilience is that a resilient constitution does not merely withstand civil crisis itself, but it also makes it possible for the rule of law guarantees to be operational in crisis conditions. In this case, of course, we have to consider the rule of law to be the core of a liberal constitution. Otherwise, it could be more neutral. But as Andrian Stone has written, uh, we can't imagine a constitution that does not have in its core essence the notion of the rule of law. Discussing resilience in relation to fundamental rights is more tricky. Resilient rights are rights that can bounce back after being exposed to limitations that have influenced that even endangered their protective scope. Resilience entails acceptance of the possibility of shrinkage, accepting infringements, accepting after all that rights may be vulnerable. But this is also one of the characteristics problem for some of proportionality per se. It allows for rights to give way. It embraces vulnerability. During crisis, the traits of proportionality unfold their full potential. They work in good conditions, but let's see how they work during crisis. Proportionality has two basic aspects for me. A defensive aspect, a proportionality is a tool, a proportionality is a tool for defending rights against limitations, but it has also a creative aspect. Proportionality is a tool for forming the content of constitutional rights. This is a substance generating function, concretizing the content of rights in real conditions. Functioning as a limit to limitations is a well accepted, well known use of proportionality, but of even greater importance is the balancing of competing, conflicting interests through its use, which delimits the content of the rights at stake. Proportionality as entailing, as being a balancing act also entails discovering, analyzing and evaluating competing rights and interests, leading to an ad hoc assessment of the impact that the measure undergoing scrutiny will have on the right. Other alternatives are explored during the search for the availability of other measures to examine the necessity of the impugned measures, that is, to ensure that the impairment even if unavoidable, is minimal. Ultimately, a choice is made in each particular case. A balancing act is conducted, resulting in a winning right or interests and an overridden one. Rights are thus structured through their endless interaction with other rights and interests, incorporating each confrontation and each outcome. Their content is rendered thus open-ended and may be depicted as a mosaic where tiles are perpetually added. The mosaic image is different from an image of concentric circles of protection that has a core 
proportionality becomes us an increasing part of the rights system serving the continuous adaptation and evolution of their content. Resilience during crisis demands this kind of adaptability. Proportionality is valuable exactly because it allows rights to adapt to the circumstances in an open and justifiable way. The already difficult question whether proportionality review leads to stronger or weaker rights due to its balancing features become even more acute at the face of crisis. The ultimate criterion for resilient constitutional rights is whether they shall remain relevant during the crisis and whether they shall be able to bounce back in the aftermath. The key question is whether constitutional rights remain a basic consideration in the drafting of measures to handle a crisis. Bouncing back entails the ability of their protective scope to expand again after the crisis-induced shrinkage. Furthermore, if constitutional rights despite of their limitation and probably because of it, work towards keeping rule of law guarantees as a priority in the duration of a crisis, then they prove to be resilient. And in that sense, as a pre-existing mechanism that adds flexibility to constitutional rights, proportionality is a tool of constitutional resilience. Exactly because it is a well-known widely used tool, it can render limitations less, less suspicious, more so as it entails the potential of recovery. Two additional elements prove to be even more important during crisis. Proportionality is a dialogical tool. We see it in Canada, very uh, obviously this phenomenon. It opens up a channel of communication between the legislator and the judge. Keeping such channels open during crisis serves as a guarantee for the rule of law. Secondly, I believe that what we are witnessing now during the pandemic is the three-tiered test for some with some further steps, becoming a do-it-yourself kit for citizens. The constant use of the test familiarizes the citizens with it so that they can understand themselves whether restrictive measures are justifiable or not. This is something uh, I'm working on now. Now, I'll just pass on to an example from Greece. In Greece, the principle of proportionality was firstly derived by way of interpretation from the rule of law principle and was later on constitutionally entrenched. In 1984, the Council of State, that is a Supreme Administrative Court, recognized explicitly for the first time the proportionality principle as a constitutional dictate deriving directly from the rule of law principle. The court stated that legislative and administrative limitations on individual rights should be necessary and related with the law's intended goal. And through this very simple, minimal words, proportionality was born. Uh, later on, it was constitutionally enshrined in 2001, and this aimed, we believed, at solidifying and encouraging its use by courts and legislators alike. This type of constitutional revision, where a long established practice leads to an amendment, is often intended as a booster for what is entrenched, while it also blocks any possibility of backstepping. Nonetheless, the application of the test in Greece was never rigorous, or at least not as rigorous as theorists would like it to be. Different courts use it in different ways, and the third step is seldomly truly applied, while standards of constitutional scrutiny appear inconsistent among different courts. It must be noted, and that's why I'm saying it's always culture-based in a sense, that in Greece, the constitution provides for a decentralized system of judicial review of the constitutionality of laws. And uh, this is concentrated in practice to three, uh, three Supreme Courts, the Court of Cassation, the Supreme Administrative Court, and the Chamber of Accounts. These three courts apply proportionality differently. What was very interesting was the application of proportionality in the course of the financial crisis. 
and its use marked different phases. When the crisis broke out, judges were reluctant to have the final say on anything leaving the decisions to the political class. A different course of action would be surprising as the Council of State in Greece was never an activist court, with the exception of some cases dealing with environmental issues. Proportionality was used in this phase to express judicial self-restraint. During the second phase, when it became clear that decisions of unconstitutionality would not interfere with mega politics and that the crisis would last for a long time, judges had to accept a business as usual attitude. Proportionality and in particular necessity were employed then as a means of scrutiny, partly because of the important place the protection of social rights has in terms of constitutional culture. I think this is the same in Portugal. Uh, in Greece, the apparent unavailability of resources was not sufficient to convince citizens that the constitutional uh, that the constitution was not violated, that constitutional normativity did not give way. The strong presence of social rights within the constitution maximized the impact of the crisis, of the financial crisis on the constitution. Allow me to elaborate a bit on that. Following the outbreak of the financial crisis in the first, in the first phase, it was the constitutionality of international loan agreements that was challenged. Judges were also asked to rule on the constitutionality of austerity measures. Decisions at this phase were carefully written to ensure that loan agreements were not put at risk. Judges made it clear that it was a job of elected representatives to take the fundamental decisions on how to respond to the crisis. So in a seminal judgment 668 of, in 2012, which upheld the constitutionality of the first memorandum of understanding, epitomizes that tendency. The court indicated that it would decide on the constitutionality of specific measures taken toward the implementation of the memorandum upon enactment and review the specific measures brought before it, that is the salary cuts, allowances and retirement benefit cuts for employees of the public sector. According to the court, measures taken in implementation of the first memorandum of, this, of understanding were not disproportional and did not violate the core content of the right to social security, legal certainty, and article one of the first protocol to the European Convention of Human Rights. The court held that the unexpected emergency during which the measures were enacted absolved the lawmaker from the obligation to conduct economic studies of the overall consequences and stress that cuts were part of a broader program of fiscal adjustment and promotion of structural reforms. In short, the court showed deference to the elected official in these decisions, and it did so through the use of proportionality. They used it as a self-restraining tool. They did not even dare to ask for, uh, uh, for some sort of studies proving that the measures would work. During the second phase, however, it became clear that austerity measures would be constantly challenged and the judiciary would have to review the constitutionality of such measures. The courts began to play an important role in tackling the crisis and much of this crisis jurisprudence became a distinct feature of the constitutional response to the financial crisis. A crucial bulk of this jurisprudence dealt with pension cuts and salary cuts. Such cases were very sensitive, triggered on one hand backlash, but also uh, they were severely criticized by uh, scholars as overly activists. In this case law, the court stressed that the discretion of the legislator to cut wages was limited by the principles of proportionality and equality in contributing to public expenditures and also respect for human dignity. In such decisions, the judiciary was faced actually with a question about who would bear the burden of the austerity measures induced by the crisis. This issue of distributing the burden of the crisis is an important element for understanding the challenges faced by the judiciary due to the crisis. In a line of decisions that came later, 
The rule, the Council of State rules that pension costs introduced through laws implementing the second memorandum violated the fundamental right of social security. The court decided that the constitution requires systematic analysis of the economic and social impact of cuts in supplementary pensions. As a result, the measures were found to be unconstitutional because such analysis had not been conducted in advance. During this phase, the court developed the principle of proportionality in conjunction with equality in a novel direction. A particular characteristic of this trend is the elaboration of necessity as part of the dialogue between lawmaker and judge. The necessity tier of proportionality acquired a life of its own, becoming one of the most basic tools for evaluating impugned measures. This new development links proportionality with a time factor that is A, the urgency of most measures which left the lawmaker with limited time to consider their impact and even less time for the liberation in parliament and B, the duration of acute emergency, determining how long can an emergency last becomes a very important element in the application of proportionality. And this I think is a keeper because it's workable for evaluating measures imposed during the corona emergency. The court during this phase of the crisis jurisprudence started to demand that the legislator pays due attention to the proportionality dictate of looking for alternatives that burden rights less. Courts demanded proof that the lawmaker had studied and took seriously alternative measures at the end the potential impact of such measures. And this rendered the second tier of proportionality a much more rigorous test test, sorry, which created a specific obligation for the lawmaker to justify the choice of measures. Nonetheless, there may be pitfalls in decisions that repeatedly use the lack of detailed studies accompanying every piece of legislation. This potentiality of the necessity test could transform it into a rule that legislation could be constitutionally permissible, provided such legislation included a detailed study of its impact. So you have a detailed study, you passed, you passed the test no matter the substance of the actual study. Ad hoc judgments in the context of the financial crisis and any crisis function, however, as constraining rather than enhancing judicial discretion. This is the case because proportionality allows the judiciary to exercise self-restraint by avoiding to adopt a predetermined stance in favor or against measures. Throughout the financial crisis, it became gradually clear that this could only be achieved through narrow ad hoc holdings. This narrowness constitutes in itself self-restraint since the creation of rules in the context of a crisis would tie the hands of the lawmaker. Through the use of proportionality to deliver narrow judgments, judges choose to partner with the lawmaker in a dialogue, but to refuse to be the ultimate decision maker. Forcing the legislator into entering a dialogue must not be underestimated, but deciding on a specific infringement of the right due to failure of the legislator to abide by proportionality, the judge provides protection to the right, strengthening it without, however, excluding the subject from future political debate. This debate is conducted in terms of a constitutional dialogue. Proportionality based on the constitutional entrenchment of rights operates structuring their content and creating an interaction between lawmaker and judge in the best of times and the worst of times. I shall conclude with some thoughts on proportionality theory. The relation of proportionality with balancing is no longer a jump scare for constitutional comparatists. In times of normality, as well as in times of crisis, constitutional rights are in perpetual conflict that dictate choices. These choices form the content of rights. Balancing and proportionality are not truly different ways of dealing with conflicts between competing constitutional rights. They're both techniques, tests, 
if you like, for weighing constitutional goods. Perhaps proportionality is inevitably a criterion for any balancing, and balancing is an integral part of proportionality. The attempt to distinguish proportionality from balancing is but a search for proportionality within balancing and balancing within proportionality. In other words, we must ask, is it possible to perform a balancing act without using a means purpose analysis as a criterion? And conversely, does not the search for the means purpose relationship ultimately, inevitably involve a comparison, an evaluation, a balancing of interests or constitutional goods. Proportionality in the context of the search for the means purpose relationship dictates that the balancing act is performed and balancing tests require the evaluation of the means purpose relationship. All judicial techniques for dealing with competing rights or the conflict between constitutionally protected rights and interests involve a balancing approach. It is the very nature of rights that imposes this approach. The use of judicial tests translates into a corresponding choice of tools such as principles, standards, rules, etc. Accordingly, the critique of judicial tests entails a critique of the tools employed. If we focus on proportionality as fostering legal uncertainty and allowing too much discretion to the judge, the steps followed and the standards used are perceived to camouflage arbitrariness. This may look as a shortcoming. By contrast, if we consider that proportionality through its structure allows the outcome of each conflict to respond to the specifics of each case, the steps followed and the standards used are perceived to guide the judge to the right balance or at least to a justifiable one. The application of categories and stricter rules may foster legal certainty and judicial self-restraint. They may, however, restrain judges too much so that they are forced to make a decision without being able to take into account the new essence of a particular case, which if true, the use of rules is the path towards rigidity. The reality is even more complex. Any conflict between constitutional rights leads the judge to engage in some form of balancing and perform a means purpose analysis, as well as to consider alternative less restrictive means. The tools are ultimately not so different from one another and the use of one does not exclude the other. Rules, standards, and principles lie along a continuum of normativity. Despite commonalities, the judiciary's choice of technique and the way it is applied is expressive of their choice of constitutional interpretation. The judicial technique and tools used have both practical and symbolic effects. They guide the judicial reasoning, or at least provide a clear and understandable structure for it. They also express tendencies towards judicial self-restraint or activism. The way judicial techniques are used define the constitutional culture in place and impact also how the constitution changes. They impact informal constitutional change. This is true in good times and this is true in bad times. During crisis, constitutional time becomes more dense and the assets and shortcomings of constitutional practices become more striking. Proportionality is a valuable tool for constitutional adjudication and for lawmaking as well in normal conditions, but is a unique tool for safeguarding rights in extraordinary ones. As such, it is a constitutional resilience mechanism. And here uh, I've come to conclude a bit more practical than the previous presentation, but I hope that uh, during the discussion we shall have, we will answer questions and face every aspect of proportionality as a balancing tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, David and Akmini for your presentation. It's true. You you presented two different approaches, a practical and a theoretical one. But what's interesting from this pres uh, presentation is the, the meeting points of these presentations of, or, or if the, there's a divorce of what is being done theoretically with respect to the test. And 
what is being done in practical terms. So this is what I propose. There's a general question for both of you. And it has been mentioned several times during this conversation. I'm going to make this, uh, ask this general question and if it's okay with you, we can think another dynamic. I'm going to ask three questions to each one of you from the audience. Clearly, they are for, some for, are for David and others for Alcmini, but you, you may answer the questions from the other colleague. So the general question, as I told you, is one that has come up several times during this conversation and is if proportionality is a methodology for ju judicial decision making, uh, that's the purpose and not to make decisions in other fields like administrative or legislative fields. So the general question is, what do you think about this? If the use of these uh, methodologies other than the judicial scope is not adequate, it shouldn't be, be done. I think Almini, Almini told us how this works in Greece. Actually, it is set forth in the constitution. It's going to be interesting to listen to this. So the second one is about the value of the methodology. They are asking what happens if some judges, let's think only about the judiciary, they don't think that the proportionality test is the best way to solve constitutional conflicts. What happens if we are before a judge who uses a, a hardcore uh, methodology or other constitutional interpretation tools? Is he deciding wrongly? Can we demand the, the judge to use the proportionality test? If it's a constitutional judge, a, a Duartist judge and he uses the positivist weight formula, we can demand the, that to the decision maker, it, either if it's Alexian, whatever name you want to give him. And that's the general question for both of you. Now, specifically, There's one question that comes up, up uh, frequently. Why do you present three tiers of the test and not one? And what's the purpose? The purpose, and you take out the end because you think it's not part of the test. You think that the end is a previous step because of how the test is used in Portugal. How do you take out the end? And I think the question is because that the Mexican Supreme Court of Justice, when it uses the test, it includes the, the proper end. So they want to know why you didn't include it when you presented it. Other people say that they want to know if you think that if the proportionality test is a norm to solve conflicts, because in the beginning you said that when, uh, norms uh, are exhausted, we use the proportionality test. So they want to know if it's a norm to solve conflicts or not. And if it's not, they want to know what is with respect to constitutional rights that are solved this way. And finally, there are many questions about this, but the summary could be this uh, positivist weight formula it's also translated into a positivist way of the test, or is it only a positivist approach about this last stage and different to the others? So I guess they want to, you to elaborate on the other stages of the test, followed in the narrow sense of 
proportionality when they apply a positive squared formula. And the three questions specifically for Alcmini are, can you elaborate more on the idea of this tool that is the proportionality test and uh, transferring it to the institutions, that is countries where clearly they didn't uh, were born there. So if these adaptations of the test, this plasticity, so to speak, has always been virtuous as you presented it. So where we have tests, notwithstanding the country we think of or the international uh, law of human rights institution, there's a virtuous use of this uh, way to make uh, judicial decision makings. Resilient, as you said. The second is, it seems that you suppose that the use of the test also fosters institutional conditions of certain features. But one question is, is it possible to think about using the test in, in constitutional conditions where there's no democracy, for instance, or what works? Well, we don't know if there's a rule of law, what you said. If the division of powers is not as clear as in certain democracies, is it possible to think about using the proportionality test or do we need certain institutions? That's the second question. And number three is you talked about the crisis in Greece and apart from the civil and political rights, social rights were affected the most, but there's skepticism on the use of the proportionality test with respect to social rights. There's a lot of leeway to always have uh, better policies or to apply the principle of progressiveness. So what's your position about this? Given your theoretical knowledge and all your knowledge of what happened in during the economic crisis in Greece. So this is the first round of questions. And now let's start to answer as I presented the questions. So please, David. Shouldn't we give the preference to the lady in answering the question? Well, if the lady would like to start, you may. Michael. There are too many questions. If I forgot, if I forget one, please uh, repeat it. Uh, for... <laughs> you can choose to okay, answer yeah. as you as you wish. Um, please feel free. Okay. Uh, two questions are about: uh, Is it what it is? We, well, it, we we're still looking to find out what what proportionality actually is. It's different to see it as a principle. It's different to see it as a test, and also. Uh, if you actually talk to judges who use proportionality, mostly I think they will say that it's a way of expressing their opinion. They do not have the test with a checklist, step one, step two, step three. I've talked to many Supreme Court justices in Greece, and they say that, of course, they know after they decide that they have to follow these steps, which in itself is a way of expressing a judicial decision. Now, how this works? First of all, we have to use some comparative analysis. N not all proportionalities are the same, right? So uh, if you have proportionality enshrined within the constitution, that this would mean that it binds firstly, anyone who makes laws. Could This could be a uh, the legislator, it could be the executive in its lawmaking capacity, especially during crisis. We've seen decrees, laws, etc., that are considered legislation, right, in, in various forms. 
uh, during any crisis, during the financial crisis, and now we see it in most jurisdictions uh, for, to, to tackle the corona crisis. So, uh, but in any occasion, even if it's established as a judicial test, this also uh, means that the legislator uh, will know that his work, his pieces of legislation, will ultimately pass this test. So in a sense, even if it's not constitutionally enshrined, if the judiciary uses it in a specific way, then it bounces back. It becomes a dialogical tool and uh, the lawmaker knows that he will be tested afterwards. Now, if you have this kind of multi-level constitutionalism and you have a court uh, an international court that will be the uh, final arbitrator of all these conflicts. In, in Greece, it would be uh, the European Court on Human Rights in many cases. So you know that the, uh, the, the, the ultimate decision of the judiciary will pass probably a second test, tested by the European Court on Human Rights, which also uses proportionality in its own way, which is not identical to the way that um, uh, the, uh, the Greek court or the Italian court uh, use, courts use it. Uh, a very good example was the UK when they had uh, uh, ratified after many years uh, uh, through the Human Rights Act. And then the judges said there, okay, now we have to switch from our own uh, analysis of reasonableness to the proportionality tool. In Greece, they, they were more reluctant. If you see decisions, they don't actually follow the way that the European Court of Human Rights uses. So it, it varies, uh, which uh, could bring me to the question, uh, if we talk about a jurisdiction where there is no rule of law at all, then as we have sham constitutions, we could have sham proportionality, right? Because any leader needs some sort of justification, if not a straightforward dictator. Uh, and of course, in liberal democracies where some rights are indeed respected, proportionality could be used because all illiberal democracies do not override all rights uh, at once. Okay, uh, so backsliding, constitutional retrogression can uh, be, a uh, can uh, um, be in line with proportionality. Some proportionality dictates could be followed. Uh, it, it, regards of, of course, it, it depends, of course, if the power grab grabs the judiciary or not. Uh, also, we've seen now in the uh, current crisis that even in countries uh, where they use uh, an official emergency in France, a sanitary emergency, even in emergency conditions, the measures have to be proportional. So even if there is a derogation from uh, normality, then again, proportionality can be used. And this is unprecedented. This phenomenon is something we will see and watch now develop through this crisis. Uh, now, uh, what happens if the judges don't think it's the best way of dealing with rights? Again, I think I've answered that it depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, if they're obliged by the constitution, then they could uh, undergo some sort of higher court scrutiny. Uh, but I do not think that you could say uh, that uh, all decisions that deal with conflicting rights have to use proportionality. Actually, my point is that even if you uh, use categorical uh, balancing, some sort of proportionality will emerge. If you look at uh, classical US decisions, the Bertnicki versus Voper decision, which is a balancing act. If you read through it, you'll very clearly see that they use the tool of proportionality. They seek for some sort of proportion. So this is why I'm saying that 
all these tools are live along a continuum. So we must not uh, make a proportionality as a fetish for constitutional lawmaking, although it's a very useful tool. And Alexian proportionality, is it what the judges use or is it what uh, we scholars like to use as a tool to understand judicial decisions? I would say the second one. Now, uh, the end, how many steps? Uh, the balancing act is something that uh, many judges are more reluctant to use. Nonetheless, we see it happen. Exactly, I'm not sure what you, uh, what anyone considers the last step of proportionality because in uh, many occasions, you would say that the last step would be a question about the core of a constitutional right. You would have to ask, even after a balancing act is performed, uh, is the core of the right violated? However, uh, let's be clear, I think that the age of proportionality is an age where we wave some sort of goodbye to the core content of rights. That's why I, I talked about leaving the circles, uh, conceptualization of constitutional protection and passing on to a mosaic where every right loses in certain occasions, wins in some occasions, and all these cars are incorporated in the body of a constitutional right, which becomes more open-ended. Uh, this would be the basic uh, rejection of using uh, in the already vulnerable social rights that are dependent on economic conditions and the availability of resources. And you say, you, 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 you use flexibility, you make even this very little thing that we have, you make it more flexible. My answer is yes, because in this way, it becomes, clo it, it becomes closer to negative rights that are, are already flexible and uh, we embrace this vulnerability rather than reject it. Uh, so I think that since the content of social rights is already open-ended due to the availability of resources, if we use proportionality to create their content with regard to social rights, it has a creative a function, the use of proportionality in each case, I think that we can slowly build rights. And it happened in Greece during the crisis. Using proportionality in different phases allowed rights to bounce back, allowed rights to regain the protective content. So I think we must not be scared of the idea that uh, we embrace the vulnerability of rights and even in rights that were already vulnerable, let's see how we can build their content through this balancing acts uh, of proportionality. Uh, so um, is it a norm? Is it a test? Is it a tool? If you go uh, to high theory of constitutional rights, yes. I think you would have to say the proportionality principle, but it's also very down to earth test. Uh, and also I think it's a language, it's a judicial language, a language of communication between lawmaker and judge. And it becomes also an international language. Imagine how easy it is to uh, use comparative analysis now during the crisis of the Corona uh, measures to see, well, Yes, but in France, they say that this is uh, disproportional because we see similar limitations imposed on rights. And so it, we're using, a, that's why I'm saying citizen do it yourself kit because citizens understand slowly the language of proportionality. And I think this is becoming also a very important aspect of proportionality because the ultimate criterion for a democracy, for a rule of law is that citizens understand why rights are limited, how they are limited. Even if the justification does not convince them, it's very good that they can have a clear uh, knowledge and proportionality is after all, 
a very, very simple test, or at least we can simplify it because I think that some of uh, the students that may have uh, had the previous analysis would see its difficult aspects. But nonetheless, the question, is this disproportional, is something that everyone can identify with. And so in that sense, it also becomes a tool of resilient rights, rights that remain relevant. I don't know if is there something I did not answer, I can answer later on in the uh, conversation we have. Much, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answers. And now let's turn to David Duarte. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, it's a lot of questions. I will try to answer them as clearly as possible. And I will start to the ontological problem, namely because uh, there was this question asking if uh, proportionality is a methodology or something like that. And I would say that quite simply, legal systems only have norms. And uh, there is no other thing in legal systems besides norms. Norms might incorporate values, but uh, since we are not looking into them, we are looking strictly to the norms that entail those values. So proportionality is a norm. In my opinion, it is a small subset of norms. Uh, and in my opinion, is a small subset of norms uh, that comprises suitability, necessity, and proportionality in a narrow sense, which has itself two different rules, the epistemic and the substantive law. How do, we how do we find it in legal systems? Normally, there is some wording of proportionality in the constitution and somehow as a customary way of thinking, we accept that proportionality entails all this subset, all this subset of norms. I would say this is the case in Germany, this is the case in Portugal, it is the case in Brazil, but there are different places where um, the understanding of proportionality does not comprise all these rules, all these norms that normally and under the German tradition are assigned to proportionality. So it is not a methodology, it is a norm or it is a subset of norms. However, this does not deny that from this norm or from this subset of norms, there are many uh, methodological problems that follow. But I think it is uh, technically inaccurate to make a confusion between proportionality as uh, a subset, a small subset with some norms and all the methodological outputs that um, proportionality implies. On the other hand, there was this question regarding um, if it applies only to judges. Of course not. It is a norm enshrined in the constitution. Let's accept this as a premise, as a true premise. And then it established a limit to all decision making. Might it be the legislator when drafting some rule into some statute? Might it be administrative norms by some administrative authority when regulating uh, topic X or topic Y? Uh, and also judges when they have to decide. Um, it is uh, a small subset of norms. It is a subset of norms that applies whenever there is some decision that implies any means and connection um, inside what is being applied. Well, it was also asked why uh, use these tiers, these three tiers of uh, proportionality tests in only, uh, and not only speak uh, merely about one. Well, uh, and I will connect this question with the other question about the end regarding the idea that the Mexican Supreme Court um, also considers the end as a part of the proportionality test. I really think that it is not a good idea to consider the end as a part of the proportionality test because proportionality is only applicable because it has an antecedent and the antecedent is only filled 
when there is this means and connection. So proportionality is only triggered when there is a means and connection. And this means and connection presupposes some conflict of norms. Let me give you an example. Imagine that for some very strange reason, reason the example is absurd, but absurd examples are useful, uh, that for some reason the Mexican parliament or the Portuguese parliament had approved a statute saying that it is permitted to kill at Tuesdays. Well, we look into the Mexican constitution, we look into the Portuguese constitution, and we see that the permission of killing at Tuesdays, it's a mean to obtain some goal. And it is a mean because there are lives that are going to be sacrificed because someone is, is being allowed to make these killings. But when we look into the Portuguese constitution or into the Mexican constitution, we will see that there is no norm whatsoever protecting uh, the killing on Tuesdays. There is no reason for this norm which means that the end does not exist on the constitution. If the end does not exist on the constitution, there is nothing on the Mexican constitution, neither on the Portuguese constitution allowing for this, it follows that there is no conflict. There is no conflict between the right to be alive and any other, any other constitutional law. And for that reason, this absurd, rule that has been approved by this imaginary parliament immediately and directly viol violates the constitution. It is unconstitutional and it is unconstitutional independently irrespective of any kind of conflict. So proportionality is not even applicable. So my point by doing and giving this example is that proportionality presupposes already the, ex the existence of the end. And it is somehow contradictory to make the analysis of the end within proportionality because we cannot do inside something what is presupposed by this something. So in my opinion, I think that is not a very good idea. On the other end, uh, the existence of three or four tests, uh, suitability, necessity, and the proportionality in the narrow sense with this division uh, within the last, uh, follows from how do we recognize what proportionality is inside the legal system. So if we accept that proportionality in the Mexican legal system and in the Portuguese legal system and in the German legal system is an obligation of means to reach an end, an obligation of the adopting the means that is least onerous, and an obligation of uh, adopting balanced decisions, then we will have the corresponding tests. For example, in other uh, legal systems, we do know that um, proportionality in the narrow sense is not used. Uh, we can think about the UK, uh, where, the, where the understanding of proportionality is totally different than this understanding that I have been making reference. So different tests for the reason of each one of the norms inside this subset of norms proportionality is call for different assessments. We have to assess if the means is suitable to the end. Let's imagine that the parliament adopted this permission of killing at Tuesdays in order to uh, make people more happy. It's not suitable. It makes no sense. People do not become happy by killing. So it's absurd. Then we have to make a second assessment regarding necessity. There are different possibilities. So we have to see which the possibility has the better ratio. And then we move to the third one, which is proportionality in the uh, narrow sense that gives rise to uh, all these laws of balancing, all these two laws of balancing, and upon which, uh, or under which, but I said, all these formulas have been drafted. Well, regarding the positivist, ah, um, I was also asked about if proportionality is a norm of conflicts. No, it is not. I would say that proportion, uh, 
more or less all legal systems have the same norms of conflicts, like lex specialis, lex superioris, lex posterioris. Proportionality is not a norm of conflicts because differently from what we call norms of conflicts, proportionality does not choose a norm between those in conflict. In my vision, the way I understand it, proportionality regulates these kind of conflicts, which are not solvable by normal norms of conflicts, but regulates in a very different way. It makes a kind of a limit. The judge, the legislator, they are free to make the choice, the choice related to the conflict, but they are free to make the choice until some threshold. Above this threshold, proportionality will just um, make some um, censorship of the choice that has been performed. So it is not a norm of conflicts, but it is the residual or by default norm that we apply whenever we have a conflict and this conflict is not resolved by norms of conflicts, which means that in some way, I think we, in a very cautious way, might say that proportionality only leads with conflicts, but leads with conflicts in a very different way that usual norms of conflicts do. do. So there is some resemblance, but the differences are much more than the similarities. Then I was asked about this positivist weight formula and why is it positivist? Um, well, And how does it work regarding the work of judges? Um, the problem is that, as you know so well, there are already many courts worldwide applying Alex's weight formula. But, and Alex's weight formula um, is an instrument for, um, it's a tool in order to organize our reasoning when we are applying proportionality in the narrow sense. It is clear that Alexey never thought about a mechanical mathematical device where you put the norms in conflict and the outcome is a solution. Nobody thinks that this kind of assessments can be made in a mathematical way. This is obvious. However, by choosing variables and by assigning values to variables, these kind of mathematical devices help us in order to make these assessments. We have to think about the amount of reasons that justify that I might say that interference in physical integrity or interference with um, personal honor is light, it is moderate or it is serious. So it makes us think and it helps us to give a better reasoning. Judges may take a lot of profit out of this kind of formulas because this will help them to reason and to justify the uh, basis uh, upon which they decided to make the prevalence of freedom of expression regarding privacy in some case and the opposite in some other case. Well, the problem is that there is a, in my personal vision, of course, uh, a strong contradi contradiction between the, me the mechanical mathematical uh, logic of Alex's weight formula with the laws of balancing. And one of these uh, problems is that there is no reason whatsoever, one of the problems I think there is in Alex's weight formula, there is no reason whatsoever to insert in this mathematical device the moral problem. The moral problem exists, but exists when we are assessing how strong the reasons are in order to choose principle one or principle two. But proportionality does not make any kind of option between moral reasons. It just says that if I'm losing something, I have to gain the same or more than that. So 
the naming of this formula, positivist weight formula, is only to somehow make explicit two things. The first is that it is a mathematical device that it is totally in correspondence with the content of the two laws of balancing. So it has nothing that comes out of the legal system. Everything is already in the legal system. Everything is already, everything that it is in the formula, it is already in the two laws of balancing. And second reason why I think it makes sense to name it as positivist, it is because it totally removes the moral side that there is very explicitly designed in Alex's weight formula. And uh, look at something. This obviously has to do with the deeper uh, problems. We have many rights on the constitutions. And um, we know that morally and socially, rights are not equal in the sense that I easily say, although being a positivist, I easily say that the right to life or the right to be alive or the, uh, the freedom of expression are much more morally and socially important than the right to broadcast uh, some uh, political party's opinions. There's no doubt about it. The problem is that formally, we have no reason whatsoever to say that this right should prevail over the other one because it is more important. It depends on the circumstances. So there is no reason to say that this possible different moral importance of rights should play some decisive uh, role in uh, proportionality in the narrow sense. Somehow, by incorporating the W variable, Alexi is, in my personal op opinion, somehow uh, giving some reason to those that defend that rights may function as trumps. And this is a total contradiction, in my personal opinion, inside the Alexian theory in itself. So to sum up, uh, it is positivistic uh, because it sticks totally to the content of the laws of balancing and the content of the laws of balancing, it is something that we accept as norms that are effectively in force in some legal sy systems um, and uh, namely ours legal systems. Well, I don't know if I, ask, I answered everything, but if I didn't just tell, say me so. Thank you very much to both of you because you answered everything you were asked. And we are coming to our end. We would like to keep on listening to you for two more days, but we'll have to wrap up this table. So I'd like to invite you to present some conclusions. If you would like to add something else about the questions you were asked or your answers, I invite you to do so. Let's start with you, Okmini. Uh, no, I think I'm, I don't have much to add. I just want to say that it becomes more and more clear that we all have our starting points. We all talk about the same thing when we talk proportionality. We have a lexing theory as a basis. Nonetheless, different judiciaries apply it in different ways. I uh, would be hesitant to accept the, the, the moral parameter set out uh, by Professor Duente is a difficult one because we uh, normally do not have any way to put priorities within rights within the constitution unless the constitution itself provides for some, which it usually doesn't. Even if some rights are in the amending formula, even then we cannot have hierarchies as such. So every time a decision must be made. Um, so uh, it is a means and analysis and it is triggered only when we have indeed difficult questions that uh, uh, when rights compete or when rights compete with uh, the general the common good in some fo form uh, uh, presented in a specific case and it, proportionality is there to uh, answer those questions and it is both uh, a rule, but also it is a test 
And uh, although uh, parts of the test seem to acquire a life of their own, I wouldn't really separate them because uh, they interact. They're useful as a whole. If you were to take, uh, for example, the necessity test out of the three tiers, then you would be left with uh, mere balancing of sometimes uh, when you uh, pass by the first step as a very easy step to um, fulfill, uh, you find out in true situations such as the corona crisis that uh, it might become much more relevant than it was because it's much more difficult to uh, judge at this particular point even uh, whether a measure is suitable it, if it can achieve the goal. So maybe this is, we have a lot to see from this first uh, underestimated, perhaps easy step of proportionality. So I think that uh, to wrap up and to the question set, uh, is it a, a set of rule, a set of norms? Yes, in a positivist way, I would say it is always a set of norms, but I think it is much more than that. I can see it as, as a tool, as a test, as an ultimate uh, dialogical tool. So I think in that sense, and it also, it is a tool that uh, for comparatists, it creates a very solid comparability between different jurisdictions. And it is a way that we even we can all communicate on a very same basis, despite the cultural differences we all have. Thank you. David, por favor. David, please. Yes. Um, well, I think I will um, use this last statement in order to recover something that I think it was more or less asked and I did not address which is uh, the idea that uh, is it possible for the judge to make bad balancing? Uh, of course it is. Um, uh, and this is something, and this is pretty much connected with um, the very common idea that balancing becomes a part of legal systems where uh, there is a strong field for subjectivity and that legislators in the first place and then judges and mainly constitutional judges in the second place are uh, in are in a position that is given by the system where they can do whatever they want well judges in now focusing on judges they almost can do whatever they want always i don't see any difference between balancing and other methodological and in applying balance or using balancing, carrying out the balancing and other operations that legal uh, that judges do. Let's just for an example, think about the famous Herbert Hart vehicle uh, example, no vehicles in the park. Let's imagine that for some reason uh, I'm entering in a park with a dog. And the police officer tells me, no, no, you cannot enter in the park with that vehicle. And I will say, this is not a vehicle, this is a dog. And then he finds me and I just make an appeal to a court and the judge says, no, no, you cannot enter the park with a vehicle, but it is a dog. No, it is a vehicle. So the judge just confirmed the fine that the police officer gave me. It is absurd. It is absurd. The debate. Did he make a very, very bad interpretation of the vague word vehicle? Yes, he did. But it was this decision. So the same happens in balancing. If for some reason, if for some reason, uh, the judge is supposed to make this balancing between the freedom of expression and the right to privacy in a situation where it is obvious that the privacy should prevail, but the judge decides otherwise it is exactly the same mistake so do you i don't know if you are familiar with the so-called uh julia robertson um doctrine uh there is this very famous spanish legal scholar legal philosopher juan jose morezo that uh, made a paper uh, he wrote a paper where he spoke about what he called the julia robertson um the doctrine which is inspired in the a movie 
where this famous actress performs a role where she's a law student. And a professor is saying that, uh, what is her opinion about this? And then she says, what it is her opinion? And that, and then the professor says, but the Supreme Court has decided otherwise. And, this, and she says in the movie, uh, Julia Roberts, um, they are wrong. So Morezo took this idea of Julia Roberts as, Roberts as an actress saying that the ju judges of the Supreme Court are wrong to, in a very funny way, create this kind of Julia Roberts doctrine, the idea that the judge, judges, they make mistakes. So I don't see balancing as a danger. I don't see that judges can take profit out of balancing more than they can take out profit out of any, uh, any other subjective uh, situation in the legal system. So um, balancing is not an option. Balancing is unavoidable. Whenever we have two norms conflicting, and the conflict is not solvable by the usual norms of conflict, there is no way out. So this kind of criticism of balancing, which is very common in some sectors like uh, Abermas or Bernd Schlink, saying that oh, we should avoid balancing, we can avoid balancing as much as we can avoid night. So it makes no sense, uh, in my opinion, to the, the way is, and that's the reason why I think many people uh, are working on uh, this sophistication of balancing. And I think the, it is a very, very important example, Alex's weight formula, uh, is that there is no alternative. So we, the, the way for the future is to try and to get the most objective possible ways of uh, making balancing. And that's all. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Professor Fotadiu. Thank you, Professor Duarte, for this presentation and for your generosity the way you shared your ideas and your willingness to answer the questions. And we hope this is only the first time we see each other, we talk, and we may share this, how this principle methodology test or whatever you want to call it is seen from different perspectives. I think all the people who were with us in our social media and in the Supreme Court Court's platform will wait for you at 11 for the table with Professor Marina Passos talking about her proposal of proportionality in the narrow sense and Professor Ruben Sanchez Hill talking about the suspension of the Claimed Act I hope you have a great day. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks a lot. Muchas Thanks gracias. Gracias. Thanks.